Thank you for coming to another episode of Resources for Humans. I'm your host, Jack Altman, the CEO of Lattice. And today we are joined by an awesome guest. We're with Steve Hopkins, who is the Director of Customer Success at Cultramp, uh, where we are right now. Um, Cultramp is an awesome company that we've looked up to for a long time. Super excited to talk to you. Thanks for being here today. Yeah, thanks, Jack. It's a pleasure having you here. So, um, Steve, just to get started, just tell us a little bit about you and maybe how you came to Cultramp. Yeah, yeah, sure thing. So I think for me, uh, Coltramp is obviously in the world of trying to make companies better for the people that are working in them and for the organizations themselves. Um, and that's something I've always been working at, I guess. Like my whole career has basically been helping companies be better places to work, often using technology. Uh, and so probably, I don't know, four, five, six years ago, um, I was out in Australia, I was in Melbourne. Um, and uh, it was actually at the time, this is sort of before all of the WeWork and, and the co-working spaces were really a big thing. Um, a friend of mine sort of took an office, opened up a small space in Richmond. It was probably about the size of this room here. Um, he was just a web development, you know, web de he ran his own web dev shop and just threw out an open invitation and said, hey everyone, I've, I've got some spare desks, come and, come and crash. And so, um, you know, I was I was sort of would work out of there a couple of days a week, and I met John and Doug, who ended up becoming ended up they were working on a startup at that time that um, that they they didn't keep pursuing, but eventually they ended up founding Culture Amp later on. And so, um, for me, I was immediately interested in the problem they were trying to solve and what they were trying to do. And then we parted ways. I um, I joined a company called Yammer uh, and sort of went on that journey, which was really just wonderful and, and Yammer, whilst it was a very different product to what Coltramp does, was basically trying to solve the same problem, was asking the question, how do we, how do we help people work in a more open and connected and kind of, um, kind of sort of culture positive way um, and have, you know, we were just happening to be doing that through communication software and so um, years later, uh, kind, of, kind of had the pleasure of sort of bumping back into you know, the founders of Coltramp when they were kind of um, in the customer development stage, but they'd sort of expanded out of that. People were beginning to love what they were doing, and I was actually recommending them to clients. So, you know, I'd go in, I'd see a Yammer client. Often, one of the things we would do is we would kind of uh, say to those clients, yeah, you can help, you can use your engagement surveys to help you understand what's going on with your Yammer adoption and how people are communicating. Um, and so off the back of that, you know, Coltramp was the only other thing I would ever pitch. <laughs> and kind of say, oh, you should, there's this great company down in Melbourne, they're doing something really different here. Um, you should take a look and then lucky enough to, to you know, kind of keep in touch. And, and when the time was right, um, there was a role available. And so I'm skipping over a lot of stuff, but that's basically how I'm here. That's great. And so you were at Yammer and you were selling this product. How were you describing it? What, what was it about Coltramp that you saw as valuable? Yeah, I mean, the, the big thing, which we still do today, but it, it's matured a lot, is that uh, it was the focus on the real-time data aspect. That was the big thing. Every company that we would talk to, I would, I would say, I, would, you know, I wouldn't pitch Coltramp right away. I would say something to the effect of, well, do you have an engagement survey? And most companies would say yes. So that was the first thing. It's like, wow, there's a lot of companies doing this. Um, there's a lot of companies collecting data. Uh, and then I... And then sort of the next question would be like, oh, well, it, you can put some questions in or you can do something to sort of leverage off the back of that and learn more about what you're doing. And almost every response was, oh, I can't do that. That's really hard or I can't work with the, you know, I can't work with the people that are doing it or even the people want to do it, but they can't do it. And it's just, it, you know, we do them every two years, you know, you, you name it. So there, there's really, there was a, at the time, there just wasn't a, like what I would almost call now, like a, or what we would call Yammer then, there's not a, there wasn't a consumerization of sort of, people feedback data, um, it was still very much locked up in either consulting companies or um, in sort of really bureaucratic kind of um, processes. So companies were doing surveys of some kind, yep. but they just didn't have the tools that Coltramp brings. That's it, yeah. Whereas Coltramp was bringing a real, like, they were bringing a real-time approach to that. So in a traditional, and actually this is sort of a good sense of why, why I think Coltramp has pushed out and grown as, as well as we have, um, you know, the, the shift that's taking place is a, is a really big one. You know, companies have been doing engagement surveys for decades. It's not a particularly new science necessarily, um, although it is definitely an underappreciated and like um, uh, underutilized science. Uh, but we've been doing it for decades and decades ago it was being done by consulting companies by and large. So, you know, we're talking about um, putting a lot of people in a room, high cost of, of going through that process. And so because of those things, companies would only see the value of doing surveys once every two years, three years, um, 
you know, decades ago, doing it once a year might have been seen as really progressive. Just because it was expensive, it might cost companies a million dollars, half a million dollars. Um, so the limit wasn't the limit wasn't that the science said it was good to survey once every two years. The limit was how much it cost. So you know, fast forward to sort of like the, the early thousands, um, software was becoming more available. You know, software was eating the world. All of those things that you would typically hear, and so it became really easy to send out a survey. Things like SurveyMonkey and and those kinds of things came onto the scene. Google Forms, Wufu even. Um, so we were seeing companies kind of like search online for good engagement questions to ask and then literally copy paste them into a platform like that and send out a survey. So it ticks a lot of boxes. You can send stuff really easily, but then the problem everybody had was that the data would come back and it's a mess and no one knows what to make of it and what to do. Uh, and so that's sort of where CultureAmp I think was growing up and what I was seeing when I was talking to my clients was they, they had nailed the piece that made it really, really easy to collect the, the feedback and really easy for the person running that project to do that. Um, but then they made it really easy to actually, un we make it, I mean we still do today, but back then they made it really easy to understand what was going on with that feedback. Um, and now the piece that we're kind of putting, you know, a lot of our effort and all of our vision as a company is built around this is like um, taking action on that feedback is kind of the next thing. And so um, all of the things we're doing, all of, the, all of the stuff that's driving our growth is really bringing those three things to bear. And that was what was unique about them at that time. Got it. So the cost of doing employee surveys has come down, the time required has come down, and the data that you get back is much richer. Yeah. So uh, I guess my question from that is, what's the impact that has on people ops people yeah. and their role? It, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's a, it's a big impact. Like people ops and just actually even outside of people ops, any leader in any business um, has, they're drowning in data today across all of their different across all of the different sort of um, things that they're working on. They might have marketing data, customer data, financial data. Uh, it's all real time, it's at their fingertips. Um, and we've really gone through that. We've really gone through everybody having access to those things and also knowing that that's a thing that we want. We don't yet have, leaders in organizations do not yet have an easily accessible, always on stream of people data. And what we're seeing is that they need it. <laughs> and so that's kind of the big shift that's happening right now. We're seeing people um, need a platform like that. They need a platform that collects all of that stuff. And so to do that, though, you have to make all the other things really easy. You have to make it easy to collect it. You have to make it easy to gather it. Yeah. So one of the most interesting aspects that you and I have talked about in terms of culture um, here at CultureAmp is the team of teams aspect. Mm. What is that? Yeah, it's a great question. Everybody that starts here has that same question, too. <laughs> so I think. Um, I'll try to be really concrete in how, I answer, in how I answer it because actually this is a, it's a passion of mine thinking how we structure organizations like this and I think one of the things I've learned more than anything else is that um, it's very hard to get into the concrete details so I'll try, to, I'll try to do that as much as I can. I think the easiest place to start is actually there's a book called Team of Teams. It was written by uh, General Stanley McChrystal um, and, and sort of talks about the journey that he went on in that they were finding themselves in an environment that required them to be adapting and changing what they were doing all the time. And so they were basically, there's sort of this, this um, saying that goes around that it takes a network to beat a network. And they had found that they had taken a really rigid hierarchy into that environment that was changing every minute of every hour and they weren't able to respond in kind. And so even in just a very raw metric sense, I think they used to run maybe one mission every night and their whole organization would be rigged around doing that one mission. And by the end of the, his tenure there, they were running you know, somewhere in the order of 30 missions a day um, that were much smaller, but sort of much more adaptable and sort of happening just without a lot of authority or a lot of sort of sign off. So that's one thing that helps people sort of set the scene in their minds. It's about being adaptable and sort of structuring your organization such that people can go out and do the thing they need to do um, very quickly. So for us, um, what that looks like is, is very structurally, everybody is in a team. There are probably about uh, 30 teams in Coltramp now, maybe a little less, 20 to 30 teams. Um, each team is charged with its own mission. Each team is made up of about sort of anywhere from six to sort of 10 people, 10's at the, the higher end. And uh, each team is really, is, is cross-functional and multidisciplinary. Um, and so what does that mean? It means that you're pulled together. We don't have functional teams. Or we don't have a lot of functional teams like you might see in traditional businesses. So we don't have a sales team or a customer success team. Um, we have 
a team that's called Agro or Bison or Cha Cha. They're all names of animals and the, the teams name themselves. It's kind of a part of their setup. Um, and those teams have salespeople in them. They have customer success people in them. They have um, a, a role specific to us, which is a people scientist in them. And their mission is to go out and expand into a market or, or work into a market. Um, and so they have everything they need to kind of go off and do that and really drive their own, their own boat. Um, and then there are, num there are a number of other types of teams around that help support those teams. So there are some teams that look a little bit more like functional teams um, that we would call amplify teams or amp teams. Their job is to kind of help amplify the other teams that are out kind of doing things. So, um, you know, one, we have, we have a team that we call the outreach team. Um, in many other businesses, it might look like your SDR or inside sales kind of, kind of um, group, but their mission is not really to just sort of fill the pipeline, although it's a big part of it. It's also to reach out to our community and work with them and, and um, create interest and sort of attendance at our events and other things like that. So, you know, they're, and they're kind of uh, spread out amongst our, our different teams as well. We also have, you know, digital marketing teams that are focused on helping those things as well. And whilst they might look more functionally similar, there's a lot of very different disciplines that are within that team too. So if I understand right, the main difference is that as opposed to a normal company where it's typically done functionally, all the engineers together, the salespeople yep. together, and so on, you do it multi multidisciplinary groups yep. that have objectives that they're centered around. That's right, yeah. And then I think importantly, um, one more concrete thing I'll say is that when we've when we become aware of something we need to learn, we will mostly spin a team up to go and learn that thing. So rather than many, many other organizations where you might only put a team on something and invest heavily in it when it's a, it's a big bet that has to go right or not, um, we will tend to spin a team up to go and learn what the right decisions are to go and make. And so rather than trying to spin a team up around a, an approach that somebody somewhere has decided is the right one, we'll say, oh no, we need to go and learn a bunch about that. How do we form a team to go and learn that lesson? And we find that's a lot faster. And there's examples we could talk through of how we've done that. Has Culture Amp been structured this way from day one or was it a change that was rolled out? It was a change that was rolled out. Um, we, the founders had always intended to do something like this. And when I joined, um, we hadn't done it yet, but we had done an experiment. There were a couple of teams that we'd spun up to try things. Um, but not long after I joined, we, we rolled it out across the whole company. So I think a lot of people ops leaders, founders, think a ton about wanting to change their organizational structure. But yeah. I think oftentimes they're afraid or they don't know how. <laughs> Yeah. What did you learn from seeing that sort of change roll out and how can people do this? Yeah, the, the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway was that we were measuring it as we went. So it sort of comes back to why our product exists in the first place. Most people when they make a change like that make it blind. They're not, they're not looking at any data, they're not looking at anything to kind of help them understand and iterate. And in every other part of building our products or our companies or anything today, we know that that's what you need to do. We know that you need to iterate and get feedback and kind of that you don't want to spend two years doing something and then ship it and then, you know, find out that it doesn't work. So in sort of every other aspect of our business, we're kind of there. The change management sort of best practices have not yet fully caught up with that. Um, and so that was the biggest thing we learned just doing it ourselves. I mean, we weren't, we were probably, we had, a, we had a reasonable level of complexity when we did it. We were in three offices and we were just opening up our London office, so our fourth at the time we did it. Um, so that's a reasonable amount of compl complexity and we were probably at about 60 or 70 people around those offices. So, um, you know, we're smaller and that made it easier, but I think it, you know, it still had a level of complexity there. And the big thing we did was we used our, we had our own dog food. We, we built out a very short survey, but one that would give us um, kind of key insights across some key questions that we, or key hypotheses we had about what people would be going through. And then we learned and we saw what was up, what was down. We learned what people were feeling and then we took action very in a very targeted sense on those questions to kind of improve those things. This is helping me understand something that I think a lot of people would be curious to learn about, which is the fact that you don't have commissions for salespeople here. Correct, yeah. And it's now easy for me to see in the context of team of teams why a salesperson as part of a team yep. wouldn't have commissions. Yeah. But can you talk to me about how that works here? Because it's so different <coughs> than the rest of the industry. Yeah, no, it is really different. <laughs> uh, everybody that we talk to, um, 
you know, is always asking that question. So I think it, it starts where you just have to understand um, that uh, pay and compensation does not affect performance. There's no scientific statistical kind of evidence that um, variable commission or variable compensation brings higher performance. There is a lot of evidence to suggest that um, it will do that or it will help generate higher performance for things that are kind of more rote or mechanical. Um, but if you're wanting people to solve really wicked, hairy, strange problems, there's no scientific evidence, or if, if there is any evidence at all, it sort of suggests the opposite, that, that paying people that way does not lead to, to better outcomes. So that's probably the first place to start. It is also true, though, that um, it does impact your culture. How people get paid, whilst it doesn't affect your outcomes and your performance, does affect your culture and the place you're building. Um, and so it's a choice you have to make. It's, a, it's one of those things, it's one of those choices where um, even a non-decision or a decision to just sort of do it the normal way is a decision in itself. And so we just took a very conscious decision to make a different type of decision when we, when we started doing that. Um, and it makes an enormous difference. The team of teams model came after that and it made that very possible. Uh, now it continues to be something that we gain a lot of um, leverage and, and, and ability from. Does it change the type of people who join sales at Coltramp? It does. Yep, it does. And I think uh, Ramon, who's our, our VP of sales, um, would, would tell you that there are a lot of salespeople out there with sales experience. Um, not all of them look like the kind of salesperson you would typically think goes to work in a high growth, high tech SaaS business. Um, and so uh, for us, and actually especially in our domain where we are coming from that shift of consulting, there are a lot of really terrific people that have, uh, they have been steeped in our domain and, and kind of the science of our work um, that have been in consulting or running their own consulting shops or doing their own, um, you know, their own thing. People operations, we've actually we've picked up a number of people from recruiting backgrounds or people operations backgrounds who, again, have a familiarity with our domain and, and the problem space, um, have been in roles that have seen them dealing with and working with uh, like customers, even if they're internal customers or they're um, candidates or whatever the case may be. Um, and they've been very heavily driven by outcomes and kind of rigorous kind of results. And so those people um, do really well. We've got a, a wonderful person that's just joined us in New York, Janine, who's a master's in organizational psychologist. She, before she joined us, she was working at a large financial services company running their, um, running their graduate recruitment program. And so, you know, she was seeing volume of hundreds if not thousands of candidates coming in through that program, managing all of that, um, working with internal stakeholders to help them find the right talent out of that pool and then managing the system that kind of brought all that together. Somebody like that is just wonderful for us uh, because she's now helping our clients go through the process of understanding their, their data and collecting feedback and all those sorts of things. She's got a you know, great sense of the domain and the industry. She's worked in it. She's dealt with you know, clients and everything else. Um, uh, but she wouldn't look like a typical, you know, like a typical sort of sales or customer facing person in a sort of typical SaaS company just because of that background. So, so in helps. this context, how do you at Coltramp think about performance management and performance development for employees here? Is it different than, than other companies? Yeah, I, I think we, there's a lot that we do that's, that's the same, I think, and then there's a lot that we do that's different. And so I think we try to be conscious about where we, where we innovate and see the need to innovate. And then there's, a, there's areas where we see the, you know, that the, the, the industry standard, or certainly the, the industry standard of peer companies to us that are fast growing kind of tech companies in San Francisco would kind of call normal. Um, so one of, the, one of the main and the biggest differences, which I think we share, is that we're very focused on the development and growth of our campers whilst they're with us. We call, we call employees at Culture Amp campers. So um, it's easy to say that, it's hard to do, but that, that's, that's where it starts. And then what that looks like to us is that um, everyone in the business, so when you're in your team structure or when you're in the team structure, um, you have a team lead, but that person is not your, what might, you might call your manager in a typical sense. That person has another person that sits out, sometimes they sit in the team, but often it's outside, called your mentor. And your mentor is the person that kind of guides your journey and performance through Coltramp, whether you're here for a year, two years, five years, we're not 10 years old yet, but you know, assuming, assuming we'll get there, they sort of help guide your journey on that path. And so they're the ones that, you know, when you're talking about the real concrete stuff, the hiring, the firing, the developing talent, those things, the mentors are charged with that responsibility within the business. 
um, but they need to and are required to work into and collaborate very closely with that person's team lead or that person's colleagues within their practice or within their kind of team. And so um, that's probably one of the most significant differences. And I wonder, with, with a somewhat less rigid hierarchical structure, yeah. um, does that enable or require more transparency in certain ways? Yeah, it does. And it, it requires a lot of communication too. And actually that was one of the things we learned implementing and adopting the Teams approach is that when we, <laughs> when we did that two years ago, so I'm, I, I run our global customer success um, kind of group, or well, that was what I did before the team of Teams sort of came in. So everybody basically reported to me. Um, and there's a lot about that that's really functional. Um, and so when we did the Teams model, I was very passionate about that. And so I remember saying to everybody, we're canceling all the meetings. We're not going to have these customer success meetings anymore. Um, you're in your Teams. That's your home now. I remain your mentor. And we're going to work in that kind of one-to-one -one context. Um, that, the lesson we've learned there is you do need some level of kind of um, practice kind of cohesion for people that are out in the teams. They're out in the teams, they're learning stuff, they're, they're trying new processes, they're building new decks, they're doing all of these things that they, they're empowered to do, but there's a lot of value also in bringing everybody that kind of shares a functional kind of connection back together on some sort of regular cadence to share what's happening and kind of reset a baseline for what our, what our, what our best practice approaches are. Um, and so I think just, just managing that balance is a really important one. So I'm curious to ask you about something um, to do with your role as the, yeah. the head of customer success here, as it pertains to Cultramp's fit in the market, actually. And um, I guess the framing for the question I have is something that is similar, I think, about Lattice and Cultramp is that we are both working on a problem space that has existed in the past, but we are trying to help improve it in certain ways, make it more employee-centric. Um, and so from our experience, we very much have been learning with our customers. And so we have certain views on the world, our customers have certain views on the world, and we've sort of grown together. Um, you all are, are quite a bit further along than us, but I'm very curious to hear today, to what degree is that balance um, from the customer success side still present? To what degree are you still learning from customers, or are you imparting wisdom? Yeah, no, we still, we still learn from our customers every day, I would say. Um, and it spans, it, it goes beyond the, the customer success realm. It goes to our teams and even our product teams that are, are back in Melbourne. So, um, uh, I mean, even, even in some ways, this is a bit of a, it's becoming a bit of an older story now, but um, a year ago we launched our second product. Um, and the way we did that was we, we pulled, again, we, we realized it was an area we had to learn some stuff about. Um, we went and formed a very small team. I think it was one or two engineers and a product manager. They went out into the market and began learning about what, what success needed to look like for customers and what they wanted out of a certain out of that product. Um, but then at some point, once we had a once we had so very quickly we had something in market that was kind of good enough that customers could buy it and use it. And at that point, we had a salesperson join that team and kind of start working uh, working with that and start learning on how to do that too. And so that learning then propagated out to all the other teams once we shipped it kind of you know, to general to general accessibility. Um, there was already a, an amount of learning that had been done that could be shared really quickly. Um, and so I think you know, we, that, that happens because our customers want to partner with us, they want to connect with us. Um, we've got a lot of, we make a lot of investments in putting on events and educational opportunities for not just our customers or prospects, but people in the domain generally um, to come along and learn about um, you know, the science behind what we do and our approach. And so in those environments, they're, just, they're, learning, they're learning rich environments for our people too. And we're constantly coming back with new insights about the market or our customers or what, they're, what they prize, what they prioritize. Um, so it's, it's, it's happening every day. I think it gets harder to take action on it because it's coming from so many different directions now, but that's where we need to depend upon our teams being pretty adaptable and sort of having the, you know, the authority that they need to go off and act in a lot of different ways too. So as engagement surveys have changed over the last, let's say, 10 years, and they continue to, mm -hmm. I have to ask you as someone at the forefront of it, what do you think is the next five years? Where will, where will engagement surveys be in five years? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think we'll continue to see the sort of consumerization or the democratization of access to that data. And I think we'll see that become a lot easier. We're already seeing that now. 
even, you know, um, we see more customers share more widely than we did six months ago, and we're seeing that more so than the six months before. So that trend will continue. I think the difference is one, one thing that I think trips up a lot of people um, is that they jump to the very end of that conclusion, which is HR shouldn't be involved in that process, and we can just build a survey tool that, like, you know, does NPS for people and surveys people every day and gives people dashboards, and, you know, the tech, it all holds up really well. We don't need the science bit. I think that's the, that's the other part. The science is becoming more important, and so that's the other, that's the other direction it's going. I think we won't, um, we'll see customers and, and, and prospects and people in that market continue to move away from consulting, um, but we will see them still uh, respect and kind of need the science behind that. I think that's sort of the, that's the balance to strike. It's, it's having the sort of really easy and simple to use technology that marries up the best of the science that's kind of out there today and that's, that's the, the line that we walk. And so there's a lot of things within that realm that, are, you know, sound really sexy like AI and machine learning and those kinds of things but it's, it's coming from that place for us anyway where it's nestled in the where the technology meets the science in a really simplistic way. And in a world where this is, where there is more data, computer yeah. science, AI, what's the role of HR? Does it increase? Does it decrease? Does it yeah. just have to change? I think it, it, it increases. It also changes. I think like we've been talking about, it becomes, it becomes very focused on the development and the, the growth of the people in a business is from a very concrete kind of performance perspective. Um, uh, but it also, you know, one of our, our chief scientists, uh, Jason McPherson, is fond of saying, you know, that when the board or the executive wants to see a financial report or a piece of financial analysis, you know, the finance group or the CFO don't go out to a consultant, you know, and kind of get that outsourced and bring it back in. Um, typically within the HR world, in many places, that's still kind of the, the case. And HR has been, um, you know, rightfully, because it was the right decision at the time, HR has tended to sort of work with partners or other groups outside of their organisation to kind of help inform what's happening inside. I think the biggest change that HR will need to, um, as a group and as a function, will kind of need to kind of keep investing in is having that data and those platforms come home to roost inside their own organisations. Um, and so that, that, that requires different roles, it requires different setup, it requires thinking about technology and um, how you take that data and use it in really different ways. And we've seen, the good thing is, we've seen those changes happen in other functions too. You know, marketing 15 years ago was in a pretty similar place. Um, they now have, you know, so much data they don't know what to do with. And even 40 years ago, you know, like the, the financial data that we had was was pretty slow and like would change at a, at, a, at a slower pace. And so now, again today, you know, you can see real time performance metrics about your company through your, you know, your your various different systems that kind of help you think about that. So so can you give us an example of a particular maybe customer story that embodied a lot of what you stand for? Yeah, I mean, I think when you think about a company that's collecting data, like analyzing it and learning things from it, then taking action, um, one of my favorites is The Motley Fool. Um, so The Motley Fool is a company, they're based on the East Coast. Uh, their whole mission is to make it um, really easy for people to invest and beat the market. And they do that via a number of different kind of educational and kind of informational services. Um, but, you know, they've been a customer of ours for a few years now and they found when they began running their survey uh, that, um, you know, that they, that one of the things, two of the things that really impacted their engagement or just how people sh showed up at work was just how open and sort of transparent the communication was which is, you know, good to know and, and not necessarily uncommon, but, but really strongly kind of aligned to just their top line engagement. Um, but then the other one was just that people, uh, it was very important for people to feel recognised um, and rewarded for a job well done. And the interesting thing about that question is that it's really easy to jump to the logical conclusion that that means more pay or better pay or better benefits. But actually for a company like The Motley Fool, they're, in, they're intensely project focused. Um, they're highly collaborative, they work on a lot of different projects and they work together on a lot of different projects. This is a company where when you walk into their office, their desks are on wheels so they can move them around and work with each other. So um, part of that culture as the company had grown was that the way people got onto projects was that other people just invited them to work with them on their project. Um, and so what started to happen over time was that one way that people felt recognition for a job well done was being invited to contribute on the cool projects, if you like. Um, and so what was happening was some people were getting exposure or sort of getting 
um, access to the really interesting kind of juicy projects and some people maybe felt like they weren't. And so there was this growing kind of um, sense of unfairness, but uh, no one was really conscious to that. It was just happening, but the data showed it out. The data showed, you know, the data showed this kind of really impacting that the, that question around kind of reward and recognition really impacted their top line engagement very heavily. And once the leaders there who were very open and transparent and, and happy to dive into the details there learned how people understood recognition, they then implemented a very simple change where they just made every role and every project need to list what they needed and kind of basically list the roles that people were going to join. Um, and so whilst that might feel a little bit bureaucratic, um, it, it actually sped them up and, and uh, led to that score increasing a lot over the life of their surveys because people felt listened to, they felt like they could share that feedback with their, with their, with their leadership and with each other, um, but then importantly they took action on it. And the action was not necessarily an enormous change, but it was a significant change culturally and kind of structurally too. Um, and it's led to them. It's led to them really learning from that. So, so the key there clearly is to take action once the data is collected. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, it, like they collected it. It kind of it goes through the whole cycle that they, they were collecting it and they were collecting the right kind of data that would help them kind of learn things that they may not necessarily have known before they went into the survey. Um, the analysis piece helped them understand what the impact of those things were having, and so they could see kind of. Um, the highest leverage things for them to take action on and then they actually took action and they rolled that out across the organization and then they resurveyed later to test how that had gone. Um, so it's a really great example of a company kind of going through the whole loop um, that, we were, that we want and we do see all of our companies uh, do. I'd love to hear a little bit about your sort of customer acquisition and in particular the way that you do it via your community which I think is very strong and, and well known in the people ops world. How do you think about your community and how it works both on the customer success side as well as the customer acquisition side? Yeah, it's a core plank of ours. It's a core way that we do business. And I think that's the first difference. Uh, we run, so for us, our community, we call it the People Geeks community. Um, it's not just ours alone. We kind of are the stewards of it and we see ourselves very much in that role. Um, so for us, what that means is we found very early on that people within the HR space they find it very difficult to talk about what they're doing. It, there's a lot of confidentiality, confidentiality sometimes in what they're doing, um, but also there's just like a lot of um, there's a lot of complexity to it, and it helps to it helps to have resources and kind of educational content coming at you that helps you form a mental model about what you might be seeing in your own context. But then it also helps to have events and chances for people to come together and talk to each other in a place that's safe. And so we really found that that's a, a really big thing for us. We now have um, tens of thousands of people kind of involved in that community. We run, have run hundreds of events um, over the last number of years. All of that takes a very real investment. Um, but that, that investment drives both our, you know, in a very rigorous sense, top of the funnel kind of prospecting. Um, people come to events, they learn about the domain space, they learn about what we're trying to do nothing to do with the product. They just learn about our approach and, and how we, we think about things. Um, and then they want to see a demo. They want to talk to us more. They want to learn more. Or they want to be on a list where they get more information. And so it, it's where everything begins for us. But then even, even if you're a customer that's been with us for four years and you're kind of consistently you know, um, going through the cycle, you're coming to those events, you're meeting our people, you're meet, you know, we, the team all go to the events. Um, and so it's a really great way to keep connected to people outside of more traditional kind of account management kind of practices where you're constantly pinging and saying, you know, hey, just checking in, how are you going with your subscription? Is there anything I can help you with? Right. Instead, we're meeting them at events and talking to them about the subject matter and kind of they're coming to us and saying, yeah, we're trying to do that. Can you help me with that? And then there's a conversation that happens later. So uh, uh, there are so many examples of times where we've been working with customers and we've not been quite sure what the next step is and we'll meet them at one of our events or meet them in one of our other sort of places around and it will just resolve itself. It sounds magical. Sorry. I wish it was more concrete, but it's a, you know, it. Um, but the investment's concrete, and and we see it so much that it's a it's a valuable part of how we build the business. So the last question I'd love to ask you is, what would be the most important piece of advice you'd have for, say, a customer of yours who is trying to improve their culture? Yeah. So, I mean, the most important piece of advice is just listen. <laughs> it is you need. Understand that you need the data, and then and then set about trying to gather it. 
um, one of my favourite uh, one of my favourite sort of things to think about is the that analogy of the um, the war planes when they would be coming back from from war during the Second World War, and they've got bullet holes, they're riddled with bullet holes, they're landing, and the military is broadly saying, "We need to. This isn't good. We need to fix the planes. They've got holes in them. We need. You know, people are getting shot down. We need to. I, I know what we need to do. We need to put more armour on on the planes." And so the question then becomes, where do you put the armour? And of course, the sort of the immediate thing you leap to is, well, we should put the armour everywhere where there's a bullet hole. Um, of course, the inverse is true. You need to be putting the armour where there are no bullet holes because it's in those locations that the planes that don't come back are, are sustaining damage and therefore you know, what's causing them to crash. And for most organisations, um, they don't even take a look at the plane when it comes back. <laughs> so they don't even, they, they're not looking at, they're not looking at what their culture is kind of saying to them. They're not looking at what their people are saying to them from, a, from an aggregate data level point of view. And then once you do start looking at that data, it can get really easy to leap to conclusions about things you should do. Um, and so you have to sort of, you have to have something in your toolkit that allows you to see the impact of that data on other pieces of that data that allows you to basically to, to make the right investments that are going to be the most leverage for you. So, but the, the, the simpler way to say that is just start listening. Great. Um, and, yeah, uh, well, that is a, uh, that's a very poignant story. And Steve, yeah. thank you so much for being with us today. Really enjoyed it. Thanks so much, Jack. Yeah.